Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the third annual Allen H. Center Distinguished Lecture in Public Relations. I'm honored to be able to spend some time with you, and I'm terribly disappointed I can't do that in person. Of course, I understand and support CNN's decision to keep me home. Limiting exposure to the coronavirus at this particular stage makes a lot of sense. In fact, my not being there with you today underscores two of the most critical aspects of leadership during a crisis just like this. One, the moral underpinning for sound decision making, and two, the free and open flow of credible, timely information. Both these things are relevant to our discussion of disinformation today. Unfortunately, but not surprisingly, we've seen a torrent of disinformation about the coronavirus in the last few weeks. False content created and disseminated precisely to mislead, confuse, and undermine public faith in our very institutions, the ones that are, we're trying to rely on. Here are just a few examples. Russia claiming that the U.S. intelligence agencies and pharmaceutical companies are behind the actual virus. A fake news site called MCM News saying the Pope and two Vatican aides have contracted coronavirus. People's Daily, a state-owned news outlet in China, disseminating false images of a completed hospital, which actually was an apartment building. And Rush Limbaugh claiming on his radio show that the deep state has created the virus as a weapon to bring down Trump. Infowars, they ran a video claiming that the Department of Homeland Security was buying up emergency food provisions. And these examples are only some of the most overt. The number of fake Facebook and Twitter accounts spreading disinformation are too numerous to cite, as are their ridiculous claims. Now, I don't want to get political here, but even the most casual observer cannot deny that the president himself has used news coverage of the virus to attack his political opposition in ways that are untruthful. Some of the false claims would be fanciful, even funny, were it not for the actual impacts that they're having out there. Grocery shelves cleaned out of potatoes and canned soups. I don't really get the potato thing. Chinese restaurants and businesses avoided by customers. Respiratory masks stolen out of hospitals. A friend of mine is a cardiac nurse down in Florida, where there are but a few coronavirus cases as we now speak. And she tells me the masks are literally disappearing off the treatment floors, putting caregivers and patients at increased risk for any number of other contagious ma maladies. Disinformation doesn't just play with our heads then, it can affect our health and our safety. This afternoon, I'd like to explore with you some of the ways, and only some, that we can fight back. A couple of disclaimers, though, to begin, if I may. First, no one has ever successfully accused me of being a technophile. I use my smartphone primarily to check email, listen to George Strait, and order takeout, pretty much in that order. I know there are technological solutions that should be explored, but please don't look for any cyber brilliance out of me today. Second, we must reconcile ourselves to the fact that there are no easy fixes to disinformation. It's a problem as old as we are a species. We can, however, dull the effects of disinformation. We can make the information environment work for us, and we can grow more resilient as a society if we are willing to admit an uncomfortable truth. And that is that we, ladies and gentlemen, are the problem. All of us, whether we work in PR or the press or advertising, or we just sit on the couch tuned to cable TV, we, the consumers and purveyors of news and information, must prove willing to change the way we absorb and interpret that news and information. And until we do, no amount of legislation, regulation, or cyber defenses are going to save us from the perils of disinformation. Yes, Russian troll farms are bad, as are the Chinese state-owned media. So are the so-called black PR firms that propagate falsehoods for profit, and the big tech companies that are unwilling to admit that they are also publishing companies. Goodness knows, we need more transparency out of government as well. But we've got to take a look in the mirror and ask ourselves, as citizens, what can we do to make ourselves less vulnerable? Well, first, we can try a little abstinence. Just unplug. There was a terrific article last week written by the former executive officer of an aircraft carrier about the degree to which combat readiness on his ship was hurt by sailors who couldn't stay offline. Distracted by their friend's posts, feeling like they were missing out, stressed out about issues over which they have no control, some of these young men and women were not appropriately focused on the mission at hand. Now, that's not just dangerous for their shipmates, it's dangerous for us all. 
I'm not suggesting we can all unplug all the time. Connective technology can be a force for good, even healing at times. And certainly not all the content to which we are exposed is disinformation. I myself rely heavily on Twitter for the knowledge of breaking news every day. All I know is that when I do take a break for a few days from Twitter and Facebook, I think more, read more, ask more questions. I'm a better analyst here at CNN, and I don't yell quite as much at the clouds and the kids playing on my lawn. And that's another thing. We need to ask ourselves why we are so damn angry all the time. Maybe it really is this or that policy, this or that politician. Maybe it really is over a cause we believe in, but it could also be that we've been exposed to disinformation. Disinformation is designed to appeal to our emotions. It gets our Irish up and our blood boiling. Think about the headlines you see in the tabloids versus those you see on the front pages of the Washington Post or the New York Times. Or how about the headlines you see in those clickbait sponsored sites versus legitimate online outlets? There's lots of exclamation points or all caps, inflammatory language. Yes, they want you to read or click, click or watch, but mostly they want you to believe. They know that you will be much more likely to believe something to surrender your good judgment if they can appeal to your emotions. That's why the Russians were so effective at stirring up American racial tensions on Facebook in 2016. It's what led a man to storm a downtown DC pizza joint that he believed was a front for human trafficking. And it's why some Americans are staying away from Chinese businesses right now. Take a look at the screen grab from the New York Post from just a couple of weeks ago, falsely and hyperbolically connecting coronavirus with a Chinese woman eating a bat. There's no such connection. A simple Google search would reveal that. But some people believed it because some people were angered by it. And sadly, because it reinforced anti-Chinese prejudice and fear in some Google searches. There's another good idea. Now, you aren't a panacea, of course. You've got to consult established sources, and that requires some effort. But there's nothing magical about teaching oneself to reverse search an image, for instance, to find out its real source. There's nothing magical about fact-checking, which we can all do. Reputable news outlets are pouring enormous resources into full-time fact-checking today, including my network here at CNN. Regrettably, it's become a 24-hour gig, and sometimes we have to do it in real time. But we believe facts are important, and so should you. Indeed, I'd go so far as to say that if you aren't getting your news from outlets that don't provide a fact-checking function in their pages or on their sites, you're cheating yourself. And if, as a PR professional, you aren't doing your utmost to fact-check every claim your company or candidate makes, you are cheating your customers, voters, and clients, your fellow citizens. Think about the editing process employed by your preferred news outlets or those in your advertising and press offices. How many people look at a story or a statement or a press release before it gets posted? Again, no panacea. I'm sure that the New York Post, for instance, employs editors. But the rigor with which and the filter through which real news gets vetted tells you an awful lot about its credibility. And let me just say, Reporters are also victims of disinformation. They get pitched all manner of false leads, some from Russian trolls and others from just plain liars. I've seen CNN lose out to competitors on breaking news, not because we didn't have the story first, but because we wanted to double and triple check our sourcing before moving it. My columns here at CNN, they get looked at by no fewer than three people before they get posted. Every hyperlink I, I cite is verified. Every fact is checked. Every quote is properly sourced. It can take up to 24 hours before my little 800 word pieces go live. And that's just for an opinion article. Yes, mistakes get made. And legitimate institutions will always own up to that. If your preferred source of news doesn't have a corrections section, there's a good chance it's disinformation. Ditch it. And if your company isn't willing to quickly issue statements when their leaders make mistakes, it might be time to find another place to work. And while I'm talking about preferred sources, let me also suggest that we need to take stock of how diverse we are in our consumption. There's risk here to be sure, but I believe the more we expose ourselves to viewpoints and perspectives that are different than ours, the more informed and hopefully the more compassionate we will become as a society. We're human beings after all. We love stories. The problem is we like to hear stories that we already know. 
or to put a for finer point on it, we like to hear stories that comport with our pre-existing views, values, and prejudices. It makes us feel better about who we are. As my friend Tom Nichols likes to say, we aren't looking for information anymore. We're looking for confirmation. And that makes us more vulnerable to disinformation. We've got to break out of our thought bubbles. Now, one way to do that is through media literacy. I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on that here because I want to get to your questions, but I firmly believe that we as a nation must devote more time, energy, and resources into teaching our youth not necessarily how to manipulate the technology, God knows they don't need our help with that, but rather how to consume smartly what they find out there. Look at this little angel. She's my granddaughter, not quite three years old. This was taken last Christmas morning. Shortly after we took this photo, I watched her grab her mother's smartphone, whip through the photographs of her opening up all of Santa's gifts, search and then live stream a series of educational videos, and then take a call from her father, who was phoning from a Navy destroyer somewhere out at sea in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. She can't tie her shoes yet, can't dress herself. She's not potty trained, at least not yet. Mom and Dad are working on that but she already uses a smartphone better than I do. And it's just a natural part of her life. I wanna know that when she starts to use a mobile device to consume news, she knows how to do it safely, that she has the tools to know fact from fiction, truth from lies, and that the disinformationists out there, for they will surely still be out there when she grows up, can't target her as easily as they can target me. Or quite frankly, her great-grandparents. A recent study by New York and Princeton universities found that people over the age of 65 were more than seven times likely to share a fake news story than those under the age of 30. And think about this. According to Pew, nearly a quarter of the electorate this year will be ages 65 and older, the highest such share since at least 1970. Media literacy isn't just for kids. It's for all of us, and it's going to need to keep up with the times and the technology because the, the, the tactics of the Russians and the Chinese and, and other bad actors in the information space, they're gonna keep changing too. Take a look at this cartoon. I think it captures it perfectly. I'll give you a second to look at it. My friends, the disinformationists have always been among us. Sometimes, sadly, it is us. But we don't have to be victims anymore. We don't have to be the problem if we're willing to step out of, of the stream every now and then, to unplug, if we're willing to choose broadly and smartly where and how we get our news, and if we are brave enough to admit to our own ignorance and then do something about it, we can make ourselves less vulnerable to lies. I have faith in the people, Abraham Lincoln once said. Let them know the truth and the country is safe. And with all due respect to Honest Abe, I just don't think that's good enough anymore. We, the people, in this day and age, must go find the truth ourselves. We must insist on the truth and hold those accountable who are supposed to give us the truth to actually do it. And then we must defend the truth. Then, maybe, we will be safer from disinformation. Thank you again, and I'm sorry that I couldn't be with you. I look forward to your questions.